So today we're going to take a look at The Future and Its Enemies by Virginia Postrel. This book sort of looks at technology and the development of technology and how that interacts with government intervention in regards to technology. And what Postrel does is she creates this model where on one side she plays dynamists. And what dynamists are interested in is uh, the freedom to try stuff, fail at trying stuff, and that this iterative process of trial and failure will bring better innovation, as well as competition will root out the weaker ways of doing things so that progress is achieved through this sort of process and it's necessary to be uh, able to be free to engage in it. And so this is, uh, roughly speaking, like a libertarian per free market type of perspective. Okay, and the way she juxtaposes it is interesting because there's, uh, she juxtaposes it with stasists, which divide into two groups. And what I think is particularly interested is how alliances can form across uh, political affiliation in regards to these groups. So the first group is the reactionaries. And the reactionaries, roughly speaking, want a return to a simpler time and sort of stuff that they value is environmentalism, uh, self-sufficiency uh, in particular, and sort of a return to perhaps a more rural way of doing things. They like value being able to do everything yourself and uh, not be dependent on commerce across large lines. So protectionist type of attitudes fit this bill where you want uh, all products to be like domestic to a particular area, whether that area is a city, you know, a state, a country, but you don't want free trade, these types of things. And um, what's interesting is there's, if you take a look at um, the types of people who are maybe pro-protectionism, um, often they can be in very different political affiliation or pro like rural self-sufficiency. They can be very different than environmentalists, but both of them kind of have this similar type of paradigm where they think uh, technology is harming humanity and it has to be restricted in some way. That the, the things that are being heralded as progress are not truly progress. Okay. Uh, the second group of stasists is the technocrats. And what the technocrats believe is technology is good, but there is a right way to do it and we're going to do it our way. And so what a technocratic vision is more involved or how it actualizes is believing that the government should make everyone do things a particular way. Uh, the most amusing example of this that I found in the book is that uh, in order for something to be labeled as a frozen pizza, the sauce must, create, uh, must contain tomato, uh, which is absurd. And it makes it so that some things like pesto as a sauce you can no longer label your, your thing pizza, right? This seems like a rather frivolous uh, government intervention that doesn't accomplish much. Um, anyways, so the idea is this one vision, one type of intervention, and sort of where the dynamists are going to disagree in a lot of cases is uh, when you have just one way of doing stuff, you don't get this, you lose the iterative process of trying new things, failing, and you also lose competition, right? If there's only one, uh, one show in town, only one way of doing things, as mandated by the government, either the government doing it or the government saying this is the only way you can do it, then it stifles this creative process. And uh, Postrel argues that a lot of times knowledge is local, and cannot possibly be assimilated to this like centralized bureaucratic apparatus. Just knowledge by its very nature is localized. And so because of that, you should let the local people do what they want. And uh, if their ideas are bad, then they'll fail on their own too. And if their ideas are good, then their ideas will rise to the top. And so it's this sort of trial by combat in terms of ideas, rather than having the government intervene. Um, and I think I touched on this a little bit, but the disagreement with the reactionaries is that the reactionaries position is, there's problems with it are twofold. One, 
is you want to dictate how other people live their lives and uh, unless you have a really good reason, you shouldn't be able to do that is kind of one argument. And secondly, she disagrees on the empirical uh, sort of uh, argument that people are better off back then. Uh, whereas like technology has brought people up in a lot of different ways over the past century. I think in particular, uh, when you look at technological progress, I think she makes the also argument in the book, but I'm not sure. When you look at it from like a very short span, uh, time span, then it makes intervention look more appealing. But when you look at technological progress over a long time period, like a hundred years, uh, and what uh, progress has done and how it's changed the quality of life, it's a much bigger deal. Like, okay, I think refrigeration's over a hundred years old, but that's like huge for uh, increasing the amount of people that aren't starving to death. Although population increases, so maybe more people are starving to death now than uh, before refrigeration was invented. So let's get into the ratings a little bit. So for utility, I gave it a 5.5. I think that this book is maybe a little useful for facilitating discussion and kind of thinking about um, government regulation as it relates to technology, but it's not tremendously useful, so I gave it a little bit of a bump. Um, I also think that, you know, thinking in a dynamic sort of way is a useful way of thinking and trying things and failing and not being afraid of failure is useful. And so I gave a little bit of bump for that, but for the most part, it's um, political commentary type of book. Uh, she cites a lot of different authors and their perspectives and sort of relates them. What it does though, is it, like it creates this model that's good for conceptualizing positions, I think, where you're going to have the dynamists and the stasists, you're going to have people who want this free, open, and iterative, competitive process, and then people who, for some reason or another, are opposed to it. Okay. For novelty, I gave it a five. I think you can find these ideas um, elsewhere. I think that maybe what you can't find is this, like, broader umbrella model way of looking at things. And so to that degree, it scores higher in novelty, but arguments uh that the arguments that are presented in the book are kind of like a diamond dozen uh but perhaps the organization of the arguments into these groupings or model is a bit more novel so i gave it a five for entertainment i gave it a six um i like her writing style um she's one of my favorite authors although here's where there's a little bit of a, a hiccup in that I, I think she does a really good job incorporating, like, information and a sort of upbeat type of style that, like, progresses and is easy to read and so is both information-rich and entertaining. But the problem with the entertainment score for this is a lot of the examples she uses are pretty old now, like 30 years old. And so they might have been contemporary then. They're not now. And so... Eh, if something's giving a lot of contemporary examples and not examples that'll stand the test of time, then once time passes, uh, I think this was published in like the early 90s, maybe, maybe the mid 90s, something like that. And so a lot of the examples are a bit old. Style, I gave it a seven. I like the style. Um, it's both information and writing style kind of rich, so I gave it a seven. Uh, I think I like some of her other books more. Uh, I think this might have been her first book, um, but I like it. Uh, readability, I gave it a seven. Easy to read. Some of the information gets a little dense. Some of the quote blocks are a little big, and it's... For the most part, it's easy to read, so seven. And uh, for interesting, I gave it a 6.5. I find the... Um, I find the model of looking at the... This sort of stuff where most of the interest is, uh, where you're you're separating, you're creating these groups of dynamist versus stasis and uh, technocrat versus uh, technocrat and reactionary. I think that that is where the interesting part is. Because a lot of the examples are old, uh, I think that a lot of them are particularly interesting because they don't relate to stuff that's like more contemporary 
And so on that basis, I kind of gave it a lower score on interesting than perhaps it would otherwise deserve. And this puts it at an overall rating of, uh, I got to scroll to the side, a 6.17, which is pretty solid. Uh, as far as recommendations go, I think that this is a weird book to recommend, and I would not recommend a lot, even though I rather liked it, and the reason is a lot of the examples are outdated. Where I would recommend it is for people who are looking specifically for like a sort of cognitive framework to look at uh, intervent government intervention and technology, uh, and also people who are interested in libertarian philosophy. Those are kind of where I think this book would be useful. Outside of that, maybe not unless some of the stuff sounded interesting. Although, I like Virginia Postrel. Uh, I would recommend taking a look at her books and looking at which one you think you might like best and trying it out. And then if you like her books, reading more of them. So, would just generally recommend her as an author, though... Perhaps not this specific book too much. Um, she has her most recent book, The Fabric of Civilization, kind of goes into the ways that fabric shaped the world throughout history. Uh, it was very important for commerce, so that one might be interesting. Um, as far as discussion goes, does anyone have a an example of a really absurd and funny government regulation? Like... Um, I haven't fact-checked this one, but I think there's... I have read that there is an area in... It's either Canada or one of the northern states, but it's illegal to have your pet moose cross the sidewalk. Uh, this isn't related to technology, but... And the reason why is apparently someone had their pet moose, um, and they would take them into the bar and get them drunk. And so, in order to make it so they can no longer take their moose to the bar, they made it illegal to cross the sidewalk, which you have to cross to get into the bar. So, now it's illegal to get your moose drunk. Anyways, I, I think of this because of the, the pizza example, which I think is just a blatant absurdity. Like, it, so somehow they're fooling the customer because there's no tomato in the sauce. It's like, oh, come on. Like, if the pizza's terrible, they just won't sell, right? And then the company goes under. So if people really are mad about uh, being swindled on the pizza, then you're going to have them just go out of business. The problem will fix itself. This is sort of the dinosaur way of looking at it. But the, the technocrat is, no, pizza needs tomato sauce. It's like, okay. Anyways, um, if you like this, feel free to do the YouTube things. Like, comment, subscribe. It helps the channel out. And have a good day.